Hello everyone. Welcome to this, I think, mini freeform episode. We'll see. We'll see how long I gab for, but I think I think it's going to be a trim one um, of the Mindful in Minutes podcast. So today we're going to be talking about meditation and pain. So specifically like physical pain. So the research behind meditation and pain, what happens to the pain part of the brain when you meditate. Um, and then another time, so originally I thought, let's talk about meditation and pain. We can talk about physical pain. We can talk about emotional pain. But I feel like these two topics are so big that I want to kind of split them up. So today I want to do kind of the mini science lesson around pain, what it is, why we need it, um, the process of it, and how meditation can help. And then we're also going to go through um, some really interesting studies around meditation and pain. So if you are like me and you love the little deep dives and the science lessons, you're going to love this one. And then later on, in this year, probably this summer sometime, um, we'll explore kind of more of that like emotional pain, like the heartache, the struggle, that that kind of a piece. But to just cover all of pain broadly um, feels like a very heavy lift. So I thought, you know what? No, we're going to split it up. Um, announcements, just a couple. Of course, the book is available for pre-order. So Mindful of Minutes, a meditation guide for the modern family. If that's speaking to you, it'd be so special if you could pre-order it. Um, pre-order numbers kind of help to indicate whether or not other stores would pick it up, which would be really cool if it was picked up by like different bookstores and things. So if you're thinking about getting it, I would encourage you to pre-order it. Um, but if it's not speaking to you, that's absolutely fine too. Um, I do have three bonus chapters that didn't make the book, but if you pre-order um, this month, you will be getting one chapter each month before it's released. I believe the chapters are um, emotion regulation, breath awareness, and I can't remember off the top of my head what the third one is. I promise I did write it, um, but it's not in front of me, so I can't remember Oh, breath work. Did I say that one? Breath, emotion regulation. Well, now this is going to bug me. Hold on. I'm going to look it up really quick. Okay. I have the document in front of me now. It is navigating change, identifying and regulating emotions, and breath work are three chapters that didn't make the book, but you will get them if you pre-order this month, depending on when you're listening. So I'll be sending one out each month. Um, so if you sign up now before the beginning of June, then you'll get all three. If you sign up in June, then you'll get the two and so on and so forth. You get it. You get the deal. Um, let's see. Now going back to my notes, my other document. Um, Yoga Nidra teacher training virtual training is July 8th through 9th. It is all day, both days. It's live, but it is virtual. It is in Central Standard Time or like Chicago time. Um, so that's coming up if you want to learn how to teach Yoga Nidra with me. That is the last um, live training that I'm doing before maternity leave. So this year, I guess. Holy moly. That I know of. <laughs> I don't anticipate doing any live trainings um, between when Poppy is born and then next year. Um, those are just trickier to navigate sweet little pork chop is going to be hanging out with his with his Grammy all weekend so that I can do that. Um, so I don't even imagine what the childcare logistics looks like with two kids. But anyways, enough about my childcare logistics. Let's talk about let's talk about pain. How fun does that sound? So the first thing I wanted to do when exploring this is I wanted to look at what the research says about meditation and pain, because honestly, it's really kind of interesting. I'm specifically, again, talking about physical pain, mostly because it's hard to quantify emotional pain. It's it's harder to study because you can't like look at like cortisol rece receptors or things like that really for emotional pain. So there isn't really a lot of data on it. So overall, high level, what does the data say about how meditation impacts physical pain? Um, first, what is pain and how does our mind and body process it? So pain is actually important. It is something, although it is certainly not pleasant, um, it's something that we need to survive. It's 
the body's way of signaling to the body that there's something wrong. It is an important survival mechanism. If we didn't have pain, we could just, you know, be walking around. We could, you know, step on something sharp and cut our foot open and not know it and bleed to death. I don't, you know. Pain is important. It's the body saying, hello, pay attention, something's wrong. Look over here, ding, 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 ding. So we need pain, although it certainly isn't pleasant. We don't enjoy it. It is essential for our safety and our survival. This is something that I talk a lot about um, in like yoga classes in particular. Not that this is necessarily about yoga, but this comes up a lot and where like yoga should never be or, or any movement really with your body, any kind of exercise, movement anything like that. It should never be painful, maybe challenging. Maybe it is, you know, there's some like discomfort, but anything that's like true pain, like sharp pain, burning pain, whatever, like true pain, we don't want that because that is the body saying ding, ding, ding. Um, something is wrong. Pay attention. So something just to keep in the back of your mind if you are someone who, you know, engages in physical activity, whether it be yoga or something else, um, challenge, struggle, some discomfort, right? That burning of the muscles, that's all fine, right? But pain is the warning sign. So just keep that in in the back of your mind. Um, it really isn't, you know, no pain, no gain, because pain is a one-way ticket to trouble and potential injury. So the problem is not necessarily when we have, you know, something happens, we step on something sharp, we touch a hot stove, and we go, ow, and then, you know, do something about it. The problem is when the pain becomes chronic or maybe there's no apparent source of the pain, right? If it's something that just lasts for a long time, I think about like knee pain and back pain or if you have just generalized like chronic pain or sometimes that's associated with other things like fibromyalgia. There's so many different reasons why you may have, when I say the term like chronic pain, I mean like longer lasting pain than just like this painful event happened, there was pain during it, it's healed and now it's gone. Um, that's where we run into some tricky spots is when our pain becomes more long lasting and chronic or we don't know what the source is of the pain. So I wanted to look at specifically what happens in your body when you experience pain. So when something happens, it starts with these special nerve cells that are designed to basically sense tissue damage. They're called nociceptor cells. There's not going to be a test on any of these things. Don't worry. And basically what will happen, so they're the ones that are designed to sense tissue damage. Then they'll fire. They send a signal immediately you know, to the spinal cord and up the brain where the information is interpreted in the brain by the thalamus and then parts of the cortex. So these are two regions of the brain. So the thalamus processes almost all of our sensory information first, then the cortex interprets it, right? So it's kind of like if it was data entry, the thalamus would be more like data collection, and then the cortex would more be like interpretation of that data that's been collected. So there's different ways that then the brain can respond. I mean, there's many, many different ways. Your brain will then, after it's collected the data through the thalamus or the signal saying, uh-oh, you know, there's something I touched a hot stove, problem, pain. And then the cortex then interprets it, does something about it. So that means maybe, you know, taking your hand off the hot stove. And remember, this is such a fast, fast, fast process, right? If you've ever touched something hot, it's like your hand is already off of that hot thing before you've even like really registered in your brain what's happening. It's like that kind of automatic part of you that just goes, oh, touch the nerves fire goes up the spinal cord through the brain back down to the hand that's taken off like that happens in an instant where it sometimes could then take our our you know more conscious part of our mind that isn't so automatic be like what the heck what just you know ouch what just happened but this actual process of like you know damage to the cells goes up is interpreted, comes back down, something happens. Um, that's so fast. That's like within an instant. But there's a bunch of different things that you can do, right? With You could faint. You could take your hand off the hot stove. You could say, ow, anything. You can get kind of these like 
endorphins and like this kind of like, you know, that like kind of that fight or flight where you're just like, oh, and then, you know, your heart rate comes up. There's so many different things that can happen that your brain will then signal to your body again to help. This is all designed to help reduce further damage and to cope with the pain. Now, often what can happen is in this process, the our good friend, <laughs> the amygdala, our very good friend, the amygdala, which if you've listened to any of these other kind of science or brain type episodes, you know, we we know her. The amygdala, she's, she's, we talk about her a lot. She's pretty popular around here. Um, just, you know, a refresher that she is um, the pain, worry, fear, fight or flight, anxiety center of the brain, especially those of us that have chronic anxiety. The amygdala tends to be a little bit bigger, a little bit overactive. And also the prefrontal cortex, who we also know, um, can be activated as well. So prefrontal cortex has to do with, and this is all very, like, I'm not, obviously, I'm about to say, like, guys, I'm not a neurologist. Obviously, if you're listening to this, you're like, well, this girl's not a neurologist. But this is just very kind of like spark notes version of what these parts of the brain do. But the prefrontal cortex, this has to do with, like, emotion regulation, also, like, focus, concentration, um, different aspects of that. So these two key main players that we already know are big key players and get activated or deactivated during meditation, they also play a role in pain, how we feel it, how we process it, how we interpret it within our brain. It's also important to note, and I did look into this to make sure that this wasn't just like a myth, um, but people do have different pain sensitivities. So we all process pain a little bit differently, and we have a different tolerance for it. So in my notes here, I must have been feeling like sassy. I was taking these notes. I wrote a note to myself. You know, it's like the different, you know, how childbirth or childbirth versus man flu, which is just me being like, you know, a little bit silly mostly because the other day this is you know I won't deviate too far but someone sent me this cuz you know we've we've all had someone that has gotten the man flu and you know surely those sniffles nearly killed them it happens you know it, it happens to to the best of us and i think a friend of mine sent me this like reel or like a tiktok and it was like no woman knows the pain of getting the man flu. Anyways, that I was feeling sassy when I wrote these notes, obviously. But all jokes aside, people have different pain sensitivities. Um, our brains seem to process, interpret pain a little bit differently for everyone, which can create kind of this different, like, quote, like, pain tolerance. So that is an actual real thing. I wasn't sure if that was a real thing or a myth. Um, But some good old research told me that that actually is true, that different people can have different levels of pain sensitivity. So why do we care about this? And the really, at least for me, I feel like, one, if you don't understand, like, what pain is, how it happens, like, what's actually happening within our bodies and why pain is important – it then becomes harder to understand why a practice like meditation or, and we're not really going to get into this today, but this is an interesting like wormhole to, you know, go down, but like how pain medication and things like that work it many of them work on like a neurological level and not necessarily like, you know, on like a, would that be like a skin level, like a tissue level, like a more, you know, body level. Um, which is interesting. But if we don't understand like the how and the why of pain, I think it becomes harder to wrap your head around why a mental practice like meditation could have such a profound impact on pain, how we interpret it and how we experience it. Plus, it's interesting and we love to learn around here. Learning is fun. Science is fun. Um, I feel like a couple of things. I want to say that this is going to be my last, um, and this is going to be my last tangent. It may not be, though. Full disclosure, I'm recording this, you know, for me, it feels late. It is about 7.30 in the evening. Um, but pork chop really wore me out today, and I feel like the later, so usually I record um, during nap time. So, like, between, like, 12 and 2, I've usually just recently had my second cup of coffee. The brain feels a little bit, like, fresher 
I feel like I just get like a little goofier and I feel like my ADHD gets a little bit more rampant and like feral by the time, you know, the the evening hours of 7.30 have come by. So anyways, that's just full disclosure, you guys. It's like very late at night here, 7.35 p.m. <laughs> and I just feel like, you know, I get, I get a little, mm, I don't know, what's the equivalent of like, a dad joke, but for like a Midwestern mom who teaches meditation, whatever that is, that starts to come out, I think after like 6.30 PM for me. So we're in the danger zone, guys. But anyways, we're along on this ride together. So an overview of just generally how meditation impacts pain. And then I want to talk about a few specific examples of interesting studies that I came across during this research. So overall, this is what the data seems to suggest. And again, my personal criteria for including something in a list of like benefits or um, how something impacts something else is I personally like a good peer-reviewed study that comes from a reputable source, um, you know, some kind of a medical journal, something like that. So that's where I have kind of pulled from to compile this list. So it appears or it suggests that after regular meditation that there can be change in cortical thickness. So it has to do with like the brain, the gray matter, which we've talked about, um, in some brain areas that make you less pain sensitive. So we know if you listen to a few of the episodes like the anatomy of anxiety or meditation in your brain, things like that, we know that meditation can physically change your brain by decreasing some matter and activity in the amygdala, which is kind of that drama queen center of the brain, while increasing some neurological activity and mass and gray matter in the prefrontal cortex, which is that one that has to do with like focus concentration, emotion regulation, things like that. We know that meditation after about eight weeks or so of regular meditation, 10-ish minutes a day, starts to change our brain on a physical level. We already know this. And so it's really no surprise that this then can impact pain because we know there's overlap in some of the parts of the brain that work with pain and also then are, you know, activated or deactivated intentionally during meditation. Um, It's been shown that meditation can reduce pain short term and long term. So sometimes this can be referred to as like first pain and second pain. First pain is kind of that like initial like I got a paper cut, right? And then that hurts because you're like, oh, it's like that sudden like, you know, first pain. And then the second pain is then maybe over time, like as it's healing, maybe that finger that he got a paper cut on like feels sore and it's not that initial like you know there's kind of the the trigger or the pain stimuli but it's kind of more of that secondary like healing pain and then of course we also have like you know more chronic pain but meditation seems to help reduce both short-term and long-term pain which is really interesting because that to me says that it is not only then kind of calming some of that sort of pain sensitivity in the moment, but then it's also having a longer impact on us in terms of how pain is, I guess, interpreted over time. One thing that I will add to this as well, it's not technically pain related, but sort of is, is that we do also know that meditation can reduce healing time and like recovering time. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head which episode it was, but we were um, exploring. I remember talking about it and reading about it and being like, that's so cool. It's so interesting. But basically during like restorative practices, restful practices, things like meditation, what's happening is that that's when a lot of the tissues of our body are actually regenerating. So we do like our healing and our regenerating, our recovering, bouncing back from illness, things like that. That happens in like rest and relaxation and like those more meditative states or sleep states. Um, So that potentially 
could be, I imagine, a piece of it too is that um, we're reducing some of that kind of recovery time. So if you did have something that caused pain, like a paper cut, um, potentially for keeping a regular meditation practice, maybe those tissues are repairing a little bit faster. And so um, we're bouncing back from that a little bit faster too. So that was my my non-scientific connecting the dots there. But I wanted to make note of that because we do know that meditation helps to kind of decrease that recovery time. Uh, meditation can reduce sensitivity to pain reception. So basically what that means is that it can, um, if you're someone who tends to have like a low pain tolerance, maybe it can make it so you're not quite as sensitive to pain or maybe your pain receptors aren't quite as sensitive. So to me, that sounds like, you know, maybe that immediate pain isn't quite as intense. Or if you're someone that is more sensitive to pain, maybe that kind of quiets a little bit with the regular meditation practice. Um, it can increase feel-good hormones, which then can also help combat pain, right? So if we have kind of these feel-good um, endorphins and things like that running through our body, which meditation can increase, and that may help potentially kind of combat um, pain that we may be experiencing. Um, meditation has an impact on the thalamus. So remember, the thalamus is the one that's like collecting the information by reducing the flow of incoming sensory information, which I thought was really interesting because I imagine that the thalamus can get, you know, a lot of information that's coming in to it, a lot of like pain information, sensory information that's coming to it because the thalamus isn't just responsible only for pain. It's like most of our sensory information in general kind of gets collected by the thalamus. So meditation, if we think about it as like withdrawal of the senses, which it's often described as, like that just kind of turned a little light bulb on for me when I read that, that the thalamus is the one that really takes in that sensory information. And then meditation, which is described as withdrawal of the senses, can help reduce the flow of incoming sensory information, one of those being pain. I thought was really interesting because that kind of told me like the how and the why behind it. Um, also, we know that meditation can help decrease the amygdala. We've talked about that and increase the prefrontal cortex, which plays a crucial role in, they believe, like more chronic pain. There seems to be a link between the prefrontal cortex and chronic pain. And then meditation really helps to kind of strengthen that part of the brain. So that I thought was really interesting. So let's dive into a couple of studies that I wanted to make note of as I was doing this research. I'm going to try my best to remember to link all of these in the show notes. Um, so, you know, yeah. That's it. That's my commitment to you. I'm going to try my absolute best to remember to link all of these in the show notes. And there were a lot of studies when you just like start looking up studies on meditation, you get 27 million results, which obviously there aren't 27 million studies out there. And I did not obviously dig through all 27 million. But this I think is really interesting and really encouraging because there are a lot of studies out there on how meditation, how mindfulness, how mindfulness-based stress reduction, um, which is a program that John Kabat-Zinn, you know, one of my, you know, JKZ, who we love, um, you know, that's his program, things like that. There's a lot of really in interesting information in the correlation between pain and meditation. Um, so one in a 2012 study, again, I'm going to link to these in the show notes if you're someone who wants to read through this yourself. Um, it looked at pain sensory processing in the brain in two groups of people. So a group of people who were regular meditators and those who were not. And they found that those who meditated were able to reduce pain unpleasantness by 22% compared to the non-meditation groups. So they believe that this was caused by the changes that happen in the brain for long-term meditators. And something else that was interesting is that they found that anticipatory anxiety was reduced by like 29% in the meditator group. So what that is, is like if they knew that the painful thing and part of the like, it's not necessarily like disturbing, but when you're going through these things and then I just think like, oh my gosh, like I'm glad people do it for science, but they talk about like their methods and some of them are just like, oh, I put like a 
really cold thing on someone's arm. But it's like there's people out there that are subjecting themselves to pain for our benefit. And I was very grateful for them. But I was reading through these methods and I was like, wow, that does, you know, that does not sound like the first study I'd like to sign myself up for. However, I am glad that we do have this data. So the anticipatory anxiety, that's like, I think of that more as like the anxiety I get. I don't really like roller coasters, but like when you're going up, before you go down on the roller coaster, you know, and you're going up and it's like click, 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 click. Oh, I get anxiety just like thinking about it. I don't like that feeling of like my stomach like leaving my body. But that is anticipatory anxiety. You're like, oh my gosh, it's coming. I'm slowly going to the top of the roller coaster. Um, I don't think I'd ever be able to meditate my way out of that anticipatory anxiety for me personally. But they did find that with this, like if they knew, I think this one was one where they were using cold. But if you knew that like basically the pain or the discomfort stimulus was coming, the meditation group, um, their anticipatory anxiety was reduced by 29%, which is pretty cool. In 2017, there was a review, so a non-pharmaceutical review of low back pain treatment. So basically they were looking at like non-pharmaceutical, oh boy, telling you guys once it once it hits a very very late hour of 7 30 <laughs> things get a little dicey in this recording closet non-pharmaceutical low back pain so looking at you know non-medication options for low back pain and they found that you know of all of these a really useful one so they so this one actually is a review of a handful of studies looking at so it's like reviewing different studies to kind of you know pull out trends and this one was, you know, looking at um, how meditation was really effective specifically on reducing low back pain. Um, so there was one example that they gave where there's a study where they did a group of 350 adults. And they, you know, in most of these, they have a group that will meditate and a group that won't. And then they'll, you know, compare. And the meditator group, they found that um, their low back pain, once they introduced meditation to them, a decrease increased by 30%, which is like huge. And then I found, then that led me to another one. This one I won't link to because it's just basically, a, they just recreated this low back pain meditation study, um, but they found really similar data as well, which is, which is cool when people can recreate it. There's a 2016 study that looked at the effectiveness of mindfulness on reducing pain. Um, this one was interesting because like they said in the study that it does work, but they openly kind of said they don't necessarily know how or why it worked. So this particular study, participants rated the pain and unpleasant. Oh, this was the cold one. <laughs> this is one where I was like, oh, I don't want to be poked with like a really cold thing. But participants rated the pain and unpleasantness of a cold stimulus prior to and after a mindfulness meditation session. And then participants were kind of randomized and then they would receive either um, basically like a, a painkiller or saline, like through an IV. They didn't know which one. And then after that, they would meditate again. And then they rated the same kind of pain or cold stimulus. And what they found was that pain and unpleasantness scores were significantly reduced after natural mindfulness meditation with the placebo, but not when they were given the painkiller. And so basically, I, that was a lot to unpack there, but basically what happened, they would get them with the cold thing. They'd say, how much did that hurt? And they'd say an eight. And then they would say, okay, here you go. You're going to get your painkiller now through this IV. And then I want you to meditate again. And they either got the painkiller or they just got saline through the IV and they'd meditate again. And then they would poke them again with the cold thing and say, okay, how much did it hurt this time? And the people that saw the biggest reduction in the quote unpleasantness scores were the ones that got the placebo. And this is the study that then they're like, we don't know why this is happening. And I always, you know, love when like, you know, we love it when someone's like, I don't know. And they were like, I, I don't know. It it worked. And this is what the data says. But we don't entirely know what it is about it that 
you know, what it is about the combination of like saline or just meditating and not using um, some kind of like a painkiller and how that can decrease the unpleasantness. But they did note that that the results were really interesting. Um, another one that I found to be interesting, this is the last one that I have here, um, is a 2015 study that looked at fibromyalgia symptoms in women, so women who have fibromyalgia. Um, and it revealed that the um, that meditation could significantly reduce perceived stress, sleep disturbance, and symptom severities, um, and that these kind of gains continued like if they maintained a continual practice, they would see a decrease in kind of these fibromyalgia symptoms um, and, in, you know, they would see improvement in not only the symptom severity, but their sleep and their stress as well. So I thought that was that was really interesting. Um, so then the last thing that I wanted to kind of end with is what are some meditation practices that can be good for pain? any, you know, any kind of pain. So I'm going to do a guided practice on Sunday that will be a meditation for pain. Um, And I get requests a lot for specific, like doing like a meditation for menstrual cramps or doing a meditation for surgery recovery. Like I'll get a lot of requests for like specific pain or alleviation of pain or recovery meditations. And I, I never felt like it just feels very specific to pick like one thing that can cause pain. So this one's more like generalized. Um, But Sunday's meditation will be one. And it seems that regular meditation seems to have the biggest impact on the brain and like kind of like long-term pain management. But there are a few techniques that seem to be really helpful in the short term that you can use if you're not necessarily struggling from like chronic pain, but maybe you're um, just dealing with any kind of discomfort. So we have the four, seven, eight breath. Um, That's where you inhale for a count of four, hold for seven, and exhale for eight. This particular breath isn't necessarily my favorite because for many people, holding that breath for a count of seven can be challenging and can um, increase the heart rate a little bit, making people feel a little bit anxious. So I usually modify this as just a regular relaxation breath, which is where your exhales are longer than your inhales. So maybe like an inhale for four and just an exhale for seven. Then we have belly breathing, just regular old relaxed belly breathing seems to be really useful for pain and discomfort. Um, One variation you can do on this is that every time you exhale with a belly breath, you can like visualize the pain leaving your body like on the exhale. Doing a body scan seems to be really useful. So you would think that if we are experiencing pain or discomfort that you may want to kind of like get out of your body, disassociate a little bit. But it seems that doing a body scan and kind of intentionally bringing yourself into your body um, can actually be sort of helpful. Um, There's a practice called body breathing, which we will do on Sunday. I've incorporated it into the guided practice, Um, but it's basically like you visualize breathing into different parts of your body to kind of fill it up with like nourishment and then exhale releasing that discomfort. And the final one is a present moment meditation where you observe and accept your discomfort. This can be useful um, where people just kind of, you know, sit with their discomfort, which again, our initial reaction might be like, ew, why would I want to do that? Um, But there seems to be a lot of benefit and just kind of like sitting, observing and accepting that it's uncomfortable or that it's painful or whatever it is and that this can kind of um, help with that. Some people told me to do this when I was getting ready to give birth to pork chop. They were like, oh, you just like, you know, and this is not, I promise this will not turn into like my, my birth story, but I certainly didn't master this with the birth of pork chop, but some people were like, oh, you just like accept that it's happening and that you accept that there's pain. And these are like non-meditation people. And they're like, and then it's just like, you just kind of go with the flow and then you give birth. And I totally believe that that works for some people. I definitely did not master that because I had like an out-of-body experience, which is a whole, it's a whole not like my soul. I feel like I actually left my body for like a little bit there and then came back. But I do know that this is something that 
like not just in kind of like present moment meditation of like accepting and observing your discomfort will actually make it not as painful that this is something that people talk about like outside of kind of the meditation space as well other you know forms of pain and discomfort and how sometimes observing and accepting it can actually kind of alleviate some of those symptoms so that as I was writing that I was like oh I, maybe this is what like people were talking about when they were like oh you just like ride the wave and then childbirth doesn't hurt as much I don't know I you know that is I was going to say a conversation for another day, but it's probably a conversation for never a day here. We are here to learn about, you know, wonderful, helpful, tactile meditation practices to improve our lives, not to hear about how I think my soul left my body when I gave birth for the first time. Um, That is all that I have for you in terms of meditation and pain and the science behind it. Hopefully we found something in here to be interesting and I think that you will like the practice that's coming up on Sunday. It's one that you can use anytime um, to hopefully help alleviate any kind of you know discomfort or pain that you're experiencing in your body. And then later on, we're going to explore, just, I think later on this summer, we're going to explore then um, emotional pain, which will be a little less scientific, but equally as fun. So thank you so much for being here. I hope that you're having a beautiful day and I will see you in the next episode.